In this unit, you will learn the human transport system, known as the circulatory system, why the human body needs to have a system to transport materials, what the circulatory system consists of, how the organs and tissues work together to complete the circulatory system. Let's do a recap session from previous lesson. The learning objective before was to identify the main parts of the heart and the main blood vessels. We need to know about the four chambers, the valves, the arteries, and the veins, aorta and vena cava. These are the blood vessels. We needed to state the function of the heart and also briefly describe the transport, aka circulatory system, in human beings with reference to the heart and the blood vessels. So we noted that the heart is an organ and the main function is to actually pump blood to all parts of the body. So this is a picture that I haven't shown you before and this is a picture of the heart when it's relaxed so you can see that the muscles are its original size and then when it's contracting you can see that it reduces in size so when the heart contracts it actually exerts a pressure so that helps to push and pump the blood to all parts of the body so we talked about the heart structure and it's about the size of your fist and it's made up of muscle tissues and it has four chambers. The upper part are called the atriums and the lower chambers are called the ventricles. These atriums and ventricles are these one, two, three, four parts. So these are atrium, those are ventricles. And their main function is to receive blood. And how the heart works is it'll contract and relax and you can see that here during contraction the size of the cells became shorter and then it, it lengthens here but it doesn't really lengthen because lengthen means to become bigger but actually it just returns back to its original size and that's relaxation and there are blood vessels and you can find at the outside of the heart this one's inside but this is a picture of the outside of the heart there are coronary arteries and veins and the coronary artery is really important because it supplies oxygenated blood to the heart so it can do all the pumping and we have the vena cava so this is the blood vessel that is on the heart itself and it receives blood from the rest of the body and the pulmonary artery which is the blood vessel here and remember artery brings blood away from the heart so this one brings up deoxygenated blood to the lungs and we have the pulmonary vein and this one brings back the oxygenated blood from the lungs to the heart and the aorta which brings oxygenated blood from the heart to all parts of the body. So if we look at the diagram, so remember that you are pretending like you're a doctor and you're looking at your patient. And so this would be the right hand side and over here would be the left hand side. So this is the right side of the heart and this would be the left side of the heart. So the right side, you have the vena cava and then you have the right atrium, tricuspid valve. I try to remember it as tri as in there's three, and three is bigger than two, so it's bigger, so I'll put it on the right hand side. So but it's not really, really bigger, it's just tri means three, so that's how I remember that it's on the right hand side. But maybe you can think of better ways to remember this than me. Okay, moving on, we have the right ventricle, and then we have the semilunar valve here. Going up is the pulmonary artery. So if you realize here on the right hand side of the heart that it contains deoxygenated blood, that's why we color it blue here. Deoxygenated means that there's less oxygen and more carbon dioxide 
So after the the oxygenated blood leaves, the pulmonary artery goes to the lungs, and this is where they gain oxygen instead and become oxygenated. So what happens here is that the left side, the, it's going to receive the oxygenated blood. The pulmonary vein receives it first from the lungs, and then it enters the left atrium. This will contract and then opens up the bicuspid valve, the tri-bi. So tricuspid on the right hand side, left side, bicuspid valve. It will enter the left ventricle right here and this will contract. And this is closed, but it would open if this will contract. The semilunar valves open and then the blood will be transported through the aorta to all parts of the body. And just in case that Somebody might ask you this part right here. Those are the tendons. Okay, now to talk about blood circulation. Today's learning objectives to state the main function of the blood, which is to transport food, aka nutrients and oxygen to all parts of the body and to remove carbon dioxide, which is a waste product from the body. We also will talk about the transport system and this one we're going to look into more detail of how this actually involves the heart and blood vessels and lastly very quickly we're, we'll talk about the heartbeat pulse and blood pressure okay so what is in the blood the blood is made up of three main parts which is plasma which is the yellowish liquid right here and this is made up of 70% water and the rest is actually nutrients like amino acids and glucose. And you also have urea, which is a waste product. Carbon dioxide is also a waste product. It also contains oxygen. Second part is the whitish colored part of blood, which is actually white blood cells and platelets. The third part of blood is the reddish color, and this is definitely made up of red blood cells. The color of your blood is actually dependent on the oxygen content of the red blood cells. If you have a lot of oxygen, it's going to turn bright red, otherwise it will turn deep purple red, deep red purple, I think something like that. But in diagrams, we usually color that blue. So, what is the function of blood? It contains all of these things and also blood cells. The main function is actually to transport nutrients, oxygen, and waste products. So, the function of the blood is to act as a transport medium. And this means that it can dissolve things so that those things can be carried. And all, most of those things are actually dissolved in the this part right here, which we call that the plasma. So this is where most of the substances are actually dissolved and that's how we can actually carry them around our body. So these nutrients can be carried from the small intestine. That's where you absorb nutrients after digesting it and it will be transported to body cells. Oxygen, you actually get it from the lungs, and then you also want to give it out to all parts of the body. Our body cells need nutrients and oxygen for energy. We also need to remove waste products like carbon dioxide. And how do we do this is we use our lungs. So the lungs can breathe in and out, and that's called inhalation. Respiration is not this part. Respiration occurs only in cells, especially in the mitochondria. Respiration is when you use oxygen and glucose and you break it down and you make energy. But after that energy is made, respiration also makes the waste product called carbon dioxide. So this is the thing, the gas, that we will need to release during exhalation. Another thing is that we cannot breathe out urea. Urea is a waste product that you make in the liver. And how we remove this is through the kidney. The kidney will actually filter the blood. 
So urea is found in the blood and then the kidney can filter that out and once it filters that and if you have too much water in your body that water and urea will mix with other toxins to actually form urine and urine will be released from your body and removed from your body eventually so the Nutrients and oxygen will actually go to all our body cells, including our arms and our head, our liver, our kidney, lower parts of our body, like our legs, and all the waste has to be taken out. So I talked a bit about the kidney removing it, but I also forgot to tell you that your skin also removes urea. So that's in the form of sweat. So remember that the lungs can help to remove waste that is carbon dioxide. That's when you breathe out. So how do substances actually get in and out of the cells itself? So over here, I'm showing you are your body cells. So actually, your body cells is not in like empty space. It's actually in liquid. And this liquid is what we call tissue fluid. So these tissues, aka lots of cells in our body coming together, the tissues are actually surrounded by capillaries. So these capillaries are blood vessels that have thin walls. What we mean by thin walls is that it's only one cell thick. So that means that it's super, super thin. And what happens inside these capillaries is that it transports blood. So blood, once your heart actually pumps blood, and when it contracts, blood will be pushed through the blood vessels, just like that. And this is going to contain all the things that we talked about, which is the red blood cells, glucose, the little platelets, the nutrients like amino acids, and yeah, pretty much a lot of stuff. So this one over here, you can see that in your body cells, there's not a lot of stuff here, but you can find a lot of glucose inside your blood vessels so this is the blood itself this right here I know that I colored it yellow as well is because this is representing plasma and when plasma seeps through the spaces of the capillaries it's going to form the tissue fluid so having a fluid like it means basically water and a lot of things dissolved in it that allows movement of particles so this means that glucose, since there's high concentration inside the blood capillary, the glucose can then diffuse into the body cells. This also happens to other nutrients like amino acids. And if you look at our red blood cell here, they're red in color. That means that they have a lot of oxygen in them. They are oxygenated. So since there's a lot of oxygen in the blood, then in the body cells, oxygen also diffuses. So it diffuses through the tissue fluid and into the body cells. So once your body cells receive glucose and oxygen, they can actually carry out respiration and make energy. But after that, you get the waste product that is carbon dioxide. Now we have a lot of carbon dioxide in the body cells. So what happens is that this carbon dioxide will also diffuse from higher concentration region in the body cells to a region of lower concentration, which is inside the blood vessels. So it's going to diffuse into the blood vessels. Some of them will actually get into the plasma, but some of them are actually carried so this one is inside the plasma, but the others are actually carried in the red blood cells. 
So red blood cells also can carry carbon dioxide, but it only does that when there's not much oxygen in them. So once these guys right here, they have carbon dioxide in them, they become deoxygenated. That means that they have less oxygen inside their hemoglobin. So what happens to this deoxygenated blood? So now that the capillaries have taken up the carbon dioxide, so it's carrying deoxygenated blood, what it can do now is that it's going to send this blood right here to the veins. So deoxygenated blood will travel to the heart this time because it wants to get to the lungs via the veins. Deoxygenated blood will travel from the body cells, from the capillaries to the veins and then towards the heart. So what happens first is that the heart will receive the deoxygenated blood from the vena cava and then it's going to go in and then the pulmonary artery will then carry that blood to the lungs. Before we find out what happens in the lungs, let's learn about the structure of the lungs first. The lungs actually contain air sacs called alveoli. So if you look at the lungs on the inside, they actually have these little cauliflower looking things, like little bulbs here. So if we zoom in there, each one of those things looks like this. And this is what you call an alveolus. If they're in a bunch, you call them alveoli. These alveoli sacs are surrounded by blood capillaries. And this is where the exchange of substances actually happens in the lungs. So when the heart contracts, it pumps deoxygenated blood to the capillaries near the alveoli. So what happens is that the pulmonary artery will then bring the blood. So over here is a capillary and the yellow color is the plasma and it has a lot of carbon dioxide. And most of this carbon dioxide is actually carried by the red blood cells. But the red blood cells here is blue because it's deoxygenated, it has a lot of carbon dioxide there. So what happens is that when you breathe in, so during inhalation, a high concentration of oxygen will enter your lungs and it will also enter the alveolus. So this means that there's high concentration here then in the blood. So again, diffusion will occur. So diffusion of oxygen and also actually carbon dioxide diffuses first. So carbon dioxide, since there's a lot in the blood, it's going to diffuse through the space and through this layer of moisture and into the air. So this one, the brown color here is actually air. And since you have more oxygen than in here, it's going to diffuse into the blood. So oxygen will come in and will get picked up by red blood cells and turning them red, bright red. So this is going to happen as the red blood cell moves along the blood capillary. So after that, we have oxygenated blood will then travel from the lungs to the heart via the pulmonary vein. So it's right here and the pulmonary vein into the left atrium, left ventricle. And then when this left ventricle contracts, so the oxygenated blood, so the bright red colored blood will then be transported to all parts of the body via the aorta. Aorta is an artery. So the blood has this thing, what we call double circulation. During one complete circulation, 
through the whole body, blood actually travels through the heart twice. And blood, so it, this is the first one, blood from the rest of the body here to the heart to the lungs. So that's going into the heart once. And then after that, after it reaches the lungs, it's going back into the heart. So that's why it's called a double circulation, because blood flows from the rest of the body to the heart to the lungs, and blood also flows from the lungs to the heart to the rest of the body. So during one complete circulation, blood actually travels through the heart twice. So lastly, we need to talk about the heartbeat, pulse, and blood pressure. Heartbeat is defined as the pulse of your heart. And what is a pulse? It's like a wave that flows in the arteries each time your heart will pump. The number of pulse per minute is called pulse rate. So this pulse rate, every time your heart beats, you count it, and that's actually also your heart rate. When we need more energy, our pulse rate increases, especially during exercise, for example. The flow of blood will actually exert a force. So you have here an artery and the walls of the artery and that's the lumen. So if there's blood flowing through here, it's going to give out a force at the walls. And that force is what we call blood pressure. So there are factors that affect your blood pressure. For example, overeating, underweight, and having a lot of stress. But if these things actually help to increase your blood pressure, and if you have high blood pressure for a long time, it will actually damage your heart, your brain, blood vessels, and kidney. So it's not good to have high blood pressure, actually. And that is the end of topic 11. Have a good day, everybody. Bye.